Hey Video Nasties! This video essay was originally written as a presentation for the Slasher Studies Summer Camp Conference. If you'd like to watch it in its original format, the link to the conference stream will be available in the description of this video. This one is for every one of us who's ever wanted to date a slasher villain. Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon, written by David Stevie and directed by Scott Glossman, was released in 2006 under Anchor Bay Entertainment and received a limited release in the United States in 2007. Set in a world where slasher villains like Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers and Freddy Krueger are real, the film follows student journalist Taylor Gentry and her crew as they document an aspiring serial killer, the titular Leslie Vernon. As a killer, Leslie idolises these slashers and models himself according to slasher film conventions. Operating as a mockumentary dripping with black comedy and self-referential humour, Behind the Mask is a loving homage to the entire slasher genre and earned generally positive reviews as a result. As a movie particularly interested in the mechanics of the slasher genre, Behind the Mask deals with and in fact discusses a great deal of horror theory right from the get-go. For one, Behind the Mask interacts closely with horror history through its use of playful metatextual and self-referential humour, notably through the clever deconstruction of slasher tropes and its references to classics of the genre. Though the concept of horror being innately metatextual or cleverly self-referential has always existed, what with Fright Night's references to Hammer Horror, Wes Craven's new nightmare deconstructing the entire Nightmare franchise, or even just the off-scenes in a film where someone references a horror movie or a lore of a monster, it really came to a head with the release of Scream in 1996, which arguably kickstarted an entire subgenre of post-slasher slasher films. All of this is commonplace, especially now, of course, but in the late 90s and early 2000s, the concept of slashers being this inherently metatextual was so new and exciting that we still feel the influence that these films had on the genre even 25 years later. It's valuable because it bridges the gap between the film and the audience, letting them in on the process and, occasionally, in on the joke, and strengthening the value of horror fan base and fan authorship. There's definitely a reason that the horror fandom is as prevalent as it is. Behind the Mask, though, is on a whole nother level in regards to its style of metatextuality, not only including it as a playful nod to the audience, but making it intrinsically involved with the film's plot. Plot. Demonstrated similarly in 1992's Man Bites Dog, a similarly done mockumentary about a serial killer, though it's done through the lens of a foreign crime drama and not a horror movie. What these films have in common is not only the inward reflection that they have toward their respective genres, be that slasher or crime drama, permitted due to their inherent metatextuality, but also the consistent questions about the values of authorship and just how far someone can go for the sake of their work. Additionally, and demonstrated in the film when Leslie tells Taylor about his plans of slasher stardom, he places intense importance on the survivor girl and her role in his becoming, inadvertently, or more likely very vertently, referencing the final girl horror theory popularised by Carol J. Clover in her book Men, Women and Chainsaws, with the screenplay actually citing Clover by name. Makes me wonder if Leslie has read any of Harry Benchoff's work. Stephen Hunter of the Washington Post quite accurately wrote that the film's breakdown of cliches is vivid and witty, and noted that its intended audience were probably genre deconstructionists and smart young people who have studied horror and slasher movies and enjoy them for their vulgar energy. Since Glossaman actually studied film and wrote his college thesis about horror tropes, Behind the Mask has a particularly interesting investment in horror academia which will be pretty relevant very quickly. Back to the survivor girl, Clover writes that the final girl is seen as pure in the broadest definition. She is virginal, culturally prized, and therefore a worthy opponent in the climax of the film. In horror academia though, the final girl character has been defined as more than a trope of the slasher genre. She is a key component to slashers functioning for a post-third wave feminist audience and a large pull for female horror fans out of a desire to see women succeed against male aggressors in a space notoriously known for its misogynistic capabilities abilities and tendencies. And though we can, of course, problematise the skewed representation of female characters since it places moralistic importance on outdated concepts like virginity, academic worth, and even occasionally fashion choices, body type, and race, that doesn't entirely negate the importance of the final girl in broader horror scholarship. Behind the Mask is especially interesting in this regard because it posits, as many feminist horror critics have argued before, that the final girl is integral to the slasher movie format and that a true slasher narrative cannot function with without her. It is she who is the most important character in the narrative, with everything the slasher villain doing in service of her growth as a horror heroine, at least in the metaphorical sense. Different from its predecessors though, Behind the Mask makes this reading inarguable, with Leslie even reiterating the text that his entire future as a slasher villain hinges on his own survivor girl's strength and capability. If it works, if she's the one, she'll emerge. Her innocence lost born again as a woman hell-bent on revenge. If she does that, 
I'm the happiest man alive. Permitted by the film's inherent metatextuality, Leslie acknowledges that at least part of his role as a horror villain is to facilitate audience catharsis at the emergence of the survival girl, and it's something he will gladly die for. And again, we can problematize the idea of a woman being defined by her in-text usefulness to a male antagonist. Leslie clearly views his survivor girl as little more than a tool to his own success, and even suggests the trauma he's surely inflicting on her is a kind of learning exercise that she will benefit from. What he believes to be empowering moments of emotional growth are traumatic and bordering on abusive. I will say though, most horror does still centre around the woman's experience, and depicts her emotional journey through the film, and not so much the antagonist. So maybe Leslie is just viewing this from an audience perspective. Sheila herself is an interesting character because it is her own interest, her passion for her work, and perhaps her morbid fascination that drives her. Leslie invites her into his world, and it is Taylor who accepts that invitation, watching and occasionally outright participating in his plan for mayhem and murder despite her claims of objectivity. Taylor, writes Teague, represents a very particular element of the horror fan base. She is the female horror fan academic. Teague continues, in Behind the Mask, Gentry represents the academic and Vernon is her text. Her engagement with him creates the movie's central conflict, Taylor's struggle between the bridge of good and evil, and its emotional resonance with the audience. Isabel Pinedo writes extensively about the internal struggle women may have in enjoying horror. Reflecting inwards as a female horror academic, she writes, my choice of book topic is intimately connected to who I am, a feminist and avid horror fan, a combination that some might regard as an oxymoron. I've talked a lot about why women might enjoy horror, the feelings of catharsis, the sense of triumph, and controversially, the morbid fascination and simple enjoyment they may have in the genre, and why they might be so inclined to defend it from people who criticise it so doggedly, sometimes for legitimate reasons, but often for not so legitimate reasons. Taylor's narrative arc in Behind the Mask directly represents a specifically female academic who struggles in rationalising her fascination with horror and its more problematic and occasionally misogynistic aspects through the somewhat contentious lens of the documentary format. As the film progresses, Leslie describes the plans of his unveiling as the next big slasher, a massacre where he slaughters a group of teens partying in his old family house. The classic kids having fun need to be murdered slasher trope is in full play here. He's planned everything from nailing windows shut to planting weapons that'll break after one hit, and even shows Taylor exactly where he predicts to have a final showdown with his survivor girl. In the finale of the film, just as Leslie's unveiling is about to unfold, Taylor loses her nerve and has to stop filming. Leslie escorts her and her crew outside and bids a bittersweet farewell because despite how much she's come to care for them, he won't let anything stop him even his pesky emotions. And though the crew begs to just leave, Taylor, the ever-passionate academic she is, returns to the scene to save the clueless teenagers inside from Leslie's rampage. And as murder after murder unfolds and every one of Leslie's predictions comes true, Taylor comes to the shocking conclusion that she was Leslie's intended survivor girl the whole time. Behind the Mask poses some interesting questions about authorship and just how much we can author our own stories before someone else steps in. Taylor believes herself to be the author, the director, until the last moment, until it's unwillingly pulled from underneath her and Leslie is revealed to have been in control the entire time, both of her and her narrative. She thinks she knows what's going on, to the point where she even believes she has a degree of control over her text, over Leslie, but she doesn't. And to make it worse, other people in the narrative do know and refuse to tell her what's going on. We might even say that Leslie is gaslighting her. But let's put a pin in that one because it'll be very relevant a little later. Because, even outside of its metatextual analysis of the horror genre, its questions about authorship in academia, and the representation of its final girl, Behind the Mask interacts with some very interesting areas of horror study for me. Those, of course, being the romantic kind. So, for today's essay, I will be looking at Behind the Mask, Rise of Leslie Vernon, and its representation of a deliberately romantic narrative amidst this metatextual slasher narrative. Not only to analyse the subtextual romance between its titular slasher and final girl, but also to examine how it replicates the romantic tropes established by the canonical text which preceded it. Okay, where to start? Oh, let's talk about gothic literature first. 
Gothic literature is a genre of fiction that largely covers themes of horror, death, and occasionally romance. Said to derive originally from Horace Walpole's 1764 novel The Castle of Otranto, Gothic literature often focused on the supernatural and monstrous, while also focusing predominantly on the everyday lives of their protagonists and their typically predestined stories and unfortunate fates. The common pleasures of the Gothic were the sublime, which indescribably takes us beyond ourselves and makes us question the spectacles and horror of our own situations. Specifically linked to Edmund Burke's 1757 work, A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and the Beautiful, which finally codified the Gothic emotional experience. Burke theorised that the Gothic emotional aesthetic must invoke the sublime, terror and the obscurity. To paraphrase Burke, the sublime is that which is or produces the strongest emotion which the mind is capable of feeling. The sublime is most often evoked by terror and to cause terror we need some amount of obscurity. We cannot know everything about that which is inducing terror or else a great deal of apprehension vanishes. Obscurity is necessary in order to experience the terror of the unknown. From this we can infer that the feelings of the sublime, terror and obscurity became essential to what would inform the gothic that we know today, and subsequently would also inform the future of cinematic horror. Soteris Petridis argues that though cinematic horror is largely inspired by gothic literature, slasher films rarely honour these gothic influences as the action is placed in familiar landscapes. Though this is maybe true that most slashers are more preoccupied with the horror of the everyday western suburbia, which perhaps diminishes the obscurity and subsequent terror, I would argue that the contemporary slasher operates as a kind of modern gothic, and explores very similar themes to what we use to in gothic literature. The past coming back to haunt you, like Laurie Strode being constantly pursued by her sister's murderer in Halloween, the isolation and loneliness of the pastoral setting, like Crystal Lake's camp counsellors being isolated from normal society in Friday the 13th, and never being able to rid yourself of the sins of the previous generations, like the Elm Street kids paying for their parents' killing of a child killer in Nightmare on Elm Street. These were, and still are, thematic tropes of gothic literature, and yet they continue to be used in even the more contemporary areas of cinematic horror. Also, suburbs didn't exist at the time of the canonical gothic novel, and seeing what has been labelled as contemporary gothic lately, modern literature has really proved that the landscape of the gothic can exist anywhere from New York and the Hamptons to an early 2000s chat room. I would instead argue that if a work can inspire the same sublime, terror and obscurity that we associate with the gothic, it effectively operates at the same heights of horror that the gothic was known for. Now, as I said before, gothic literature can and often does cover themes of romance. The more obsessive and damning the better. An apt comparison piece to the slasher final girl dynamic I'm discussing in this essay, and my personal favourite of the gothic literature canon is Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. The book concerns two wealthy families living in the West Yorkshire Moors, the Earnshaws and the Lintons, and their turbulent relationships with the Earnshaws adopted son, Heathcliff. Heathcliff and what he represents is a staple in the gothic genre, a Byronic hero, a man proud, moody, cynical, with defiance on his brow and misery in his heart, a scorner of his kind, implacable in revenge and yet capable of deep and strong affection. While Heathcliff is a character with a lot of cultural baggage attached to him, often compared to a demon or even the devil, this type of male characterization is often where the gothic's concept of obsessive, often damning love is formed. Love, as depicted through the gothic, is equated to the strongest emotion which the mind is capable of feeling, as capable of evoking sublime terror and obscurity as any horror can. Wuthering Heights is widely considered to be one of the greatest love stories in the English language, while at the same time being a compound of vulgar depravity and unnatural horror, which indeed links it to the same vulgar energy that slasher movies are known for. It has been described as surely the most beautiful and most profoundly violent love story, and its themes surrounding love, obsession, morality and spirituality have seen since been cemented as generic staples of gothic literature since its publication. So, what does Wuthering Heights have to do with slasher movies? Now, we've had romantically inclined slasher movies before. We've had killer boyfriends since... There's always some stupid bullshit reason to kill your girlfriend. A couple of killer girlfriends and the occasional tragic monster romance. But the one that jumps to mind, particularly when compared to Behind the Mask, is Candyman. 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 Only four times. Originally written by Clive Barker of Hellraiser fame, a gay director and writer well known for blending horror, romance and eroticism in his work, Candyman is a truly gothic romance about a mythological killer seeking a companion to add to the legend that keeps him alive. 
interesting. The melancholic romantic edge imbued in the titular character elevates the film to near art house existentialism and the film really highlights just how fluid the gothic label can be and indeed perhaps how limited the discourses of the gothic can be, especially racially. Even in the middle of an urban housing development, somewhat that goes against the milieu of aristocracy and regality we, the Academy, associate with classic and canonical gothic literature, Candyman flourishes as a true example of a gothic love story with profound violence at its heart. Both Candyman and Behind the Mask represent very similar final goals, the female academics trying to fight their morbid fascinations with their respective texts. This concept of a woman who can't leave well enough alone is exampled throughout the gothic and is therefore exampled throughout cinematic horror too. The desire to return back to the crime scene, in a sense, to ignore that which puts us in danger for the sake of our own morbid curiosity is something that motivates many horror protagonists and indeed often motivates the audiences that watches them too. However, in gothic texts like Wuthering Heights where Kathy returns to Heathcliff and Jane Eyre when Jane returns to Thornfield Hall for Rochester, both Helen, who can't help but return to Candyman's lair, and Taylor, who can't help but return to Leslie, follow a pattern of potentially romantic horror narratives that were established in the text that preceded them. Which I suppose brings me to why I think this text in particular is so romantic. So let's unpack that a little. When it comes to both Taylor and Leslie, there remains a constant question of choice. Taylor chooses to seek Leslie out. She chooses to participate in his plan. She chooses to stay when he inevitably proves that he's dangerous, not just to his victims, but maybe to her too. She is always speaking with Vernon and trying to understand him, both for the purposes of her work and as a way to come to the terms with her fascination or perhaps her attraction. Similarly, Leslie is choosing his fate. Even when Taylor tells him he can change his mind and leave with her, he says, I made a choice, I made a choice to provide a counterbalance to all those things that we hold good and pure almost associating both himself and Taylor with a predestined vassal of good and evil. I also don't think it's at all insignificant that Taylor and Leslie are both aspiring their respective fields, be that journalism or serial killing. Leslie's becoming has a significant importance for both of them, and to put it nihilistically, they are both hoping to profit off of other people's pain. At the beginning of the film, this places them at sort of equal footing in terms of moral ambiguity, likeable people with incredibly dark motivations. But by act three, they both make the active choice to be each other's counter. But hold on, video nasty. Didn't you say earlier that Leslie was gaslighting her? And yes, yes I did. But this has significance in the gothic too. Gaslighting, named after the 1938 British play Gaslight, is a form of psychological abuse in which false information is presented to victims with the intent of making them doubt their own memories, perceptions and judgments. The concept of gaslighting is often used in the gothic, most significantly in the novel Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier, which depicts a young, unnamed woman marrying an older, wealthy man and being haunted by the presence of his dead wife, the titular Rebecca. I won't go too into the story, but throughout the book, the protagonist faces explicit gaslighting from not only her new husband, but also the staff who worked underneath his deceased wife, particularly from an older housekeeper, Mrs Danvers. Rebecca's influence on contemporary gothic is evident even now, with 2021's Yes Daddy referencing it by name, but Rebecca was arguably influenced itself by Jane Eyre, another story about a young woman marrying an older man with a sketchy past. But Rebecca is significantly more involved in the feelings and narrative journey of its protagonist, questioning what this constant deliberate deception can do to a young woman's psyche, and how much can a woman really choose when she's being lied to. We might even say that Rebecca sort of introduced the concept of a survivor girl into the horror genre, especially when it's the young, virginal protagonist not Mrs Danvers or Rebecca who succeeds in the end. There is no argument that Leslie is manipulating Taylor. Even if Taylor chose to go to Glen Echo to follow Leslie and indeed to stay even when he basically attacked her, Taylor is staying because she doesn't know what's going on. She stays because she doesn't know she is the survivor girl that Leslie is talking about. The reveal of Taylor's survivor girl status invokes the sublime terror and obscurity I discussed earlier from both Taylor herself and the audience, which can only be done when information is kept in the dark like this. I said earlier that Behind the Mask questions the value of authorship. Savannah Teague raises the interesting idea of the film having three distinct lenses with which it views the story. The camera lens, the diegetic material being recorded on camera that is controlled by Taylor, the slasher lens, Leslie's skewed vision of his plans, and the true lens, the events that are actually happening in the film.
film, which are essentially Taylor's point of view, a vision on her world that she can't control. Taylor is a documentarian. That is the first thing established in the film. And although she is not the camera operator, she is the one directing the shots. It's not at all coincidental that this true lens is only used when Taylor has been left in the dark. Ergo, why it is most significantly used in the final act of the film, when Leslie re-enters the house to fulfil his killing spree and Taylor has to go back in to stop him. Though this change was criticised by audiences, I think it's a really interesting cinematic representation of Taylor as a character, in so much that it is only true because it is a depiction of her limited knowledge and her inability to author the story in a way she wants. There's much academic debate surrounding the ethics of this very idea, particularly with the sticky conversation around cinema verite or truthful cinema. How far can cinema be truthful when it's only from one perspective? But even the most avid documentary defender would have to concede that documentaries are inherently authored. Even the act of editing documentary footage is a sense of shaping a story. Like I'm doing right now. And if I were to criticise Taylor as a documentarian, I would say that she definitely has a sympathetic bias towards her text. Much like I do. So let's talk about Leslie. Leslie Vernon is the film's titular slasher, living in a world where slasher villains are real people with very real body counts. He claims to be a boy from a local urban legend who killed his family, before being killed by the townsfolk, exacting his revenge on the very grounds where he killed before. However, when a psychiatrist, Doc Halloran, interrupts Taylor and her crew, it is revealed that Leslie is in fact an ordinary man named Leslie Mancuso, whom Halloran treated in Reno, Nevada, once again reiterating that the entire film is about authorship and thusly perhaps calling into question the entire slasher genre. As we learn more about Leslie through the film, we experience the same struggle that Taylor has. She is torn between how to perceive Vernon. With the mask, he is a monster, but behind the mask, he is a likeable and gregarious goofball who keeps two pet turtles. It also certainly helps that Leslie is a pretty good looking white guy, the exact sort of man teenage girls in true crime communities get fixated on. Oh, he's kind of cute. He's a murderer! But it's kind of cute. Taylor's professional and personal fascination with Vernon drives the more anonymous and silent gaze of her camera. And when Taylor is in control of her lens, its focus is on a handsome young man rather than a vulnerable woman. Now, am I saying that behind the mask inverts the male gaze, a deeply contested phrase popularized by Laura Mulvey to discuss the ways in which cinema itself is framed through a male lens that we often view slasher movies from under the presumption of predominantly male audience? No. But I'm not saying it doesn't not invert it. As earlier cited, Carol J. Clover additionally argues that slasher films present us in startlingly direct terms with a world in which male and female are at desperate odds, but in which at the same time, masculinity and femininity are more states of mind than body, meaning that male slashers can often be viewed as just as androgynous as their female survivors and vice versa. In regards to Behind the Mask though, I would argue that Leslie is framed as particularly androgynous, perhaps even more so than Taylor is. Taylor never diminishes her femaleness, nor particularly masculinizes herself in her final fight against her aggressor, which Clover argues is commonplace for the survival girls before her and is also something that Leslie comments on. This is visually manifested when she reaches for a big, long, hard weapon. It's deeply symbolic. She's empowering herself with cock. Taylor doesn't arm herself with a knife, pitchfork, or a sword, the generic phallic metaphors of the slasher genre, but instead kills Leslie with an apple press, weaponizing a symbol of fertility and original sin in Christian dogma and reclaiming it. Furthermore, the crushing of Leslie's head, concealed by his mask until the last moment, could be compared to birthing pains as Taylor gives birth to a reborn Leslie, who survives his killing and is resurrected as the notorious slasher he dreamed of being. Because yonic metaphors can be just as important as phallic ones. I'd say that Freud is rolling in his grave, but he was cremated. Leslie, however, is quite androgynous if we look at him through the lens of implicit binaries. For example, he's well-read and has a clear interest in philosophy and literary theory. He's quite lean and slender, despite a... Uh, <clears throat> particularly sweaty workout sesh, uh, to the degree that the slasher lens attempts to compensate for that, giving him a more bulked appearance to seem more threatening and strong. And while typically a slasher villain may have a more masculine name, e.g. Jason Voorhees or Michael Myers, Leslie's name matches Taylor's in its usage as unisex, although it leans more towards feminine usage from a Western perspective. Additionally, Leslie is pretty talkative, with his voice being the more predominant one throughout the movie. Typically, male killers are silent, with some exceptions, and generally we associate 
create a more chatty villain with femininity, hence why Leslie is silent in his slash lens and more talkative in the true lens. As well as this, he examines himself, his plans and his motivations in a very academic way. If I'm going to argue that Taylor is a female horror academic, the conclusion that Leslie is an academic in his own right is a pretty accurate one to make. We might even argue that Taylor is Leslie's text, and they're both grappling with a similar fascination and kind of attraction to each other. They have this connection to each other that only they themselves understand. To push this connection even further, Leslie has such a thorough understanding of both Taylor and the genre that he occupies, when he gives her an out, telling her that she can stop the documentary and leave him, he knows that she will come back, motivated by her own curiosity and fascination, and in the climax, her tenacity to do good. He also knows that as a true survivor girl, Taylor will adhere to the slasher convention of returning to the scene of the crime, since, as Clover writes, the film cannot work if the final goal doesn't return to her site of trauma. To link this back to the gothic, in a scene where Nellie, Wuthering Heights' narrator, asks why she wouldn't wed Heathcliff, Kathy responds, He's more myself than I am. Whatever our souls are made of, his and mine are the same. Though I'd say it's appropriate to call the main relationship of Wuthering Heights, uh, toxic, this scene essentially confirms that Heathcliff and Kathy are obsessed with each other. They are two sides of the same person, a kind of gothic doubling, and even if Kathy knows that a relationship with Heathcliff would be doomed from the start, her obsession never wanes, seemingly even in death. And I would argue that Behind the Mask does the same thing. It directly suggests that the slasher and the survival girl are uniquely connected, that they are two sides of the same person, much like Kathy and Heathcliff. Unlike them, though, they bring out the best in each other, even if it's through grotesque means, and they both help the other to realise their true potential, with the slasher going down in notoriety, and the survival girl a woman reborn. In terms of relationships, even if the dynamic is toxic or problematic, nobody else understands the slasher like the survival girl and vice versa. Hence, whatever our souls are made of, his and mine are the same. I'd say that it's not at all coincidental that slashers and final girls often have relationships of some kind. Billy Loomis, one half of the original Ghostface, was Sydney's boyfriend, and Roman, a later Ghostface, was her brother. Michael Myers doggedly stalks Laurie Strode, who is often read as his sister, and Freddy Krueger becomes so obsessed with Nancy Thompson that he stalks her actress, Heather Langenkamp, in Wes Craven's New Nightmare. Behind the Mask even depicts this very concept through the characters of Eugene and Jamie, Leslie's mentors and close friends. Eugene was a slasher villain who worked in the 70s, intended to be read as Billy or the Mona from Black Christmas, but is now retired and living a quiet life outside Glen Echo with his wife Jamie his survivor girl. In a pretty pivotal scene, Leslie drives Taylor and her crew to meet his mentors, and even before everyone meets, the dialogue is pretty interesting. I figured it'd be good for you to meet with them, you know, give you some perspective, kind of a a bridge between the past and the future. A textual relationship between a slasher and a survivor girl are Leslie's best friends, and he wants to introduce Taylor, his survivor girl, though she doesn't know it yet, to them. He describes them as a bridge of past and future, and on the surface, one might read that comment as being referential to just himself and Eugene. But if we consider the already established connection between Taylor and Leslie, and how Taylor has already willingly involved herself in the process of the slasher villain, the bridge between Eugene and Jamie is past, and Leslie and Taylor as future becomes a lot more, dare I say it, romantic. As well as this, the original screenplay, which interestingly opted for a male documentarian, suggests that the relationship between slashers and final girls as a kind of taboo amongst slashers, but also includes Leslie oddly fixated on the relationship between Eugene and Jamie, and textually romantically unfulfilled, perhaps pining for the forbidden fruit of the final girl, so to speak. Need I explain the imagery of apple crushing? The scenes that follow feel a little less like a student documentarian chasing her big break and more like a new girlfriend meeting her boyfriend's parents for the first time. The four have dinner together, share backstories and advice, and Eugene even tells Taylor what drives a slasher villain like him and Leslie. Every culture, every civilization from the dawn of man has had its monsters. For good to be pitted against evil, 
you have to have evil. Which is what Leslie himself would reiterate later in the film, again demonstrating just how much their story is predestined. These scenes are personal and intimate, and really demonstrate the chemistry between Leslie and Taylor. In these moments especially, it's easy to forget that there's a camera crew behind Taylor, filming everything she sees, making the distinction between filmic lenses even further obscured. And this isn't the only scene that explores Leslie and Taylor's obvious chemistry either. Leslie frequently invites Taylor to participate in the slasher movie process, whether that be yanking a string to close a door or placing an ominous paper for his would-be survivor girl to find in a library, which she does without any semblance of hesitation, letting her fascination overtake her rationale to stay objective and inadvertently participating in her own fate. And when they play out successfully, he asks if it's okay to hug her, to which she consents. From there, and once that initial contact is formed, he touches and hugs her frequently, and when he pulls away, she always seems to be smiling. Their chemistry comes to a head in a camera scene just before Leslie is about to realise his plans. He sits alone with Taylor in comfortable silence and quietly says that he's so happy. When he starts to sob, Taylor holds his hand and the camera lingers on that silent means for her to comfort him. And even when he stops crying and decides to get started, she doesn't immediately let go and there's even a moment where the touch lingers just a second too long. Now, this might be a reach, but the attention this scene plays to a simple hand-holding isn't one entirely divorced from academic inquiry. After all, the act of hand-holding is one so simple, yet one dripping with romantic meaning and importance, that people write poems, essays, and songs about the yearning to just hold someone's hand and feel held by them in turn. Dr. Sylvia Neves writes, many studies in neuroscience show that touch produces oxytocin, a feel-good chemical, and that holding hands serves the purpose to feel a deepening in human connections. Even turning our attention back to horror study, Midsummer posits the important question. Danny, do you feel held by him? Does he feel like home to you? I'm just saying, dude, hand-holding is intimate as hell. Also, just before this scene, Leslie straight up admits that he's a little bit in love with her and like, I'm so mad that he's manipulating, mansplaining, male-wifing right now because he's literally talking about her! You love her, don't you? I love the idea of her, of what I hope she'll find within herself. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Like, come on, Leslie, just tell her you like her. It is nice that I have to analyze the subtext of a straight relationship for once, though. <laughs> That's equality. But, of course, like any other slasher and final girl, or truly any gothic romantic pairing, Taylor and Leslie are doomed from the start. Once Leslie begins his killing spree, he cannot stop it, even if Taylor begs him to, because he is the predestined evil to her good. But, even as Taylor is about to kill him, after he's slain a plethora of innocent people, including one of her crew members, there's just a moment of hesitation from her, long enough for Leslie to remove his mask. This is framed as a deeply intimate act, and maybe even a little sensual. Separated from the slasher persona that he's constructed for himself, and finally under the true gaze, Taylor's gaze, he mutters his last words. before Taylor supposedly kills him and sets fire to the tool shed where they fought, thus destroying her place of trauma. When she stumbles out, she is exactly what she and Leslie said she would be, a woman reborn and hellbent on revenge. And, because this is a horror movie, if you stick around long enough after the credits roll, we see that Leslie himself is reborn too. Finally, the slasher legend that he dreamed of being and sure to terrorise generations after him. Much like Candyman, Taylor is what keeps Leslie's name alive. It is her companionship that pushes him into the ranks of slasher stardom. From here, Taylor's future is uncertain. Or at least it is for me because I can get my hands on the sequel comics or find any copies online. But people tell me it sort of canonizes Taylor and Leslie's romance, so I'm taking that as a win. It also appears the PR team behind Behind the Mask are big fans of Leslie and Taylor as a ship too, so Make of that as you will. But in conclusion, Behind the Mask, Rise of Leslie Vernon successfully follows a long line of slashes before it in its use of metatextuality and self-referential humour, placing Leslie himself on the same level as the greats. Not only that, its use of a romantic subtext amidst its horror narratives successfully replicates the same gothic tropes that the horror genre was built off of, and associates it with a writerly history often deemed as canonical and valuable in academic circles. And who knows? Maybe one day we'll get that sequel and Leslie and Taylor will have settled down into retirement together, maybe teaching their own new protégés about the right of the slasher and the final girl. We can only hope.
Hey video nasties, <laughs> thanks for watching this video. It's been a while since the last, but work, school, being alive gets in the way sometimes, but I'll try not to have another eight month gap between videos again. If you'd like to catch me between uploads, you can check out my Twitter, at Video Nasty, the same way it's spelt here, for some streams of consciousness and horror hot takes. And if you'd like to support me further, you can swing by my Patreon for access to my essay scripts and exclusive content, and my patron crew, who are cool and very wise. Till the next one, Video Nasties, stay safe and remember to always stay spooky.